Romans chapter 14. We'll read the first 12 verses together in just a moment. Um, we're starting a section of Romans where Paul deals with the problem of diet and days and when you worship, and frankly, just the matter of opinions, uh, where we have opinions that differ from one another. Um, of course, uh, you have opinions. I just know the facts. And so that's, that's the difference between the two. But, uh, you know, sometimes we, we hold ideas and, and uh, uh, believe things, and they may not be as, as crucial as, as, uh, as we'd like people to think they are. And so what Paul is going to deal with is when Christians clash and what happens when their opinions sort of uh, collide with one another. Uh, the issue, one of the main issues that will be dealt with, if you're just gazing at the text right now, you'll see that he talks about people who say, well, we should never eat meat. We should all be vegetarians or vegans or whatever the definition you want. Uh, and we should only eat vegetables and herbs and um, healthy food and things like that. And uh, the other group of Christians are saying, no, nah, we can eat pretty much anything we want. You want a Big Mac, go for it. It's, it's great. You know, but we need to understand the, the cultural environment of that and how um, meat as a food item functioned uh, in, in the ancient world. Paul doesn't mention the, the details so much in this passage. He uh, gets into it a little more deeply <clears throat> when he talks about the same issue in uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. So he spends three chapters on the subject uh, at, at that point. Uh, but one of the difficulties of living in the ancient world was that the pagan religion was so woven into your culture and your society that it was pretty much impossible to make a move without colliding with something pagan, unlike today. Uh, you know, that, that it, it was just everywhere. Uh, it's, it's not like people were, were really strong believers and, and evangelistic about paganism or anything. It, it, it was more, it, it was just there. That was the given. That's the way society was. It, it was, it was uh, just the way you had to operate. And, and part of that was the way you put food on the table. Uh, for example, if you wanted to give a nice dinner uh, for some friends, you invited company over. And so uh, in order to honor your friends and to let them know that you were a good host or hostess, uh, what you would do is you would take the, uh, the, the, the meal uh, that, that you're going to serve and you would take it to the pagan temple and you would offer it to the idol there as a sacrifice so that it would be blessed and then your guests would be blessed by eating this food that had come through the system. And so you were really honoring the people that you invited into your home by serving them food that you had first sacrificed to an idol. And not only that, if you belong to a union or a trade guild, really, unions are kind of anachronistic, but if you belong to a, a, a trade guild, uh, most of your meetings were probably held in the fellowship hall of the local pagan temple. Um, you would all get together to talk about your union activities and, and your guild and how to make more money and all that. But the first thing you would do in your meetings is you would make a sacrifice to the patron god or goddess of your trade guild. And you did that so that your meeting would be blessed. And just everybody did this. They didn't think much about it. They've been doing it for years. And so that's just the way it was. And so as a Christian, maybe you had been a member of, of, of a trade guild. You were, say, a mason, a stonemason. And, and now in that guild, you had to, um, uh, that's the only way to get work. And, and so now as a Christian, you're being asked, well, shall I go into the uh, union hall there in the, in the pagan temple and when we have our fellowship meal, when we all sit down to dinner together, that food was sacrificed to the idol to bless our work. And I'm not really into that anymore. What do I do uh, about that? Uh, a lot of, lot of celebrations were held in the pagan temples. If you were invited to somebody's wedding reception um, or perhaps to their wedding anniversary or a birthday party, it would be held in the fellowship hall. Um, and by the way, many of the pagan temples had a fellowship hall that doubled as a gymnasium so they could also... <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're listening. But, uh, uh, but if you uh, went, went to that, that party, it would be held in the pagan temple, and the food served would, would have been sacrificed, uh, you know, symbolically to the god or the goddess beforehand to bless the endeavors. It's just what a good host or hostess would do. And so it was just about impossible to make a move without coming into contact with the fact that here was food set before you, sacrificed to an idol, and somebody was telling you, oh, I sacrificed this to the idol for you. you know? 
and you're saying, I wish you hadn't told me that, you know, that kind of thing. And so in that context, uh, some of the Christians were saying, well, what do we do about it? And some of the Christians were saying, well, we don't do anything. Who cares? I mean, we've been doing this for years. We did it before we became Christians. We'll do it now. It just doesn't matter. It's just background noise of our culture. And, and a lot of us go through life that way. We look at our culture and our society as though it's just the background noise of how we live. We just don't think too much about, well, what movies should we go to? Well, we just go to the movies, and we'll decide what movie to go to when we get there. Well, what about the code ratings? Is it okay to go to an R-rated movie? No. Is it okay to go to a PG-13? Probably not. Okay for PG? Well, kind of. Is it okay to go to a G movie? Well, no, because you're supporting the theater that, that shows all the other movies. I mean, you see, you see how it runs. But most of us don't think about that. We just go and see the entertainment. We listen to the same uh, uh, music as the society around us. We speak the same words and have the same speech patterns. We use the same, sadly, a lot of times the same profanity and curse words that, that uh, the world around us uses. They don't care. Why should we? And we just sort of drift through life, and, we, and, and it's background noise. We just don't care. Now, back then, there was definitely a set of Christians who said, what, shall we eat foods uh, and meat sacrificed to idols? And the answer was, absolutely not. We can't distort the gospel. We can't uh, uh, twist our, our witness to Christ by eating this food and, and, and making it seem like, well, I'm a Christian and you're a pagan and they're just about equivalent. It doesn't matter what you are. Hey, uh, kumbaya, we're all fine. And no, we've, we've got to take a stand on issues like this. And so we can't eat meat, not even meat that we buy in the marketplace. Because, by the way, the meat in the marketplace was probably sacrificed to an idol first before it reached the marketplace. And so when you went to the marketplace, you would look on the package and see if there was a P for pagan with a little circle around it to make sure you were <laughs> eating acceptable food. If you didn't get that, don't worry about it. But, uh, and so they were saying, absolutely not. Let, let's just be absolutist about this. And there are other Christians who are saying, well, what does it matter? I mean, when you think about it, the idol is nothing. I mean, there, there's no power to an idol. In fact, there are no gods. I mean, this is just a statue. You know, it's the same as if they, they sacrifice this food to a brick wall. So what? That, that is their problem. We are free in Christ. God has set us free in Jesus. Uh, we know the truth. We know that, that there is nothing to this. And so it's okay to eat the meat uh, if, you, if you feel like it, if that's what you want to do. And so two groups of Christians starting from exactly the same starting point, starting from the point of the oneness of God and the supremacy of his glory and the fact that, that he alone is sovereign over us, starting from that, we concluded, cannot eat meat. Or starting from that, that there's only one God, we concluded, yeah, it's okay to eat meat. And so we share the same convictions. It's just in how they're applied to our lives. We start to collide with each other. And the question is, what do we do about that? And Paul's going to talk about that. Now, there's another issue mentioned in there, if you're, if you're again, looking at the, at the text, and it has to do with uh, days. It says that some people think that one day is more important than another day, and so uh, we ought to set that day aside for whatever reason. Um, the, the ancient pagans in, in Roman culture, they really did not have a day per week that, where they worshiped. They didn't have a worship day uh, in the week. They just worked seven days a week. Unlike today, they worked seven, seven days a week, and uh, they actually looked down on the Jews who used to goof off one day a week. You know, how, how, do you, how are you ever going to get anywhere if you only uh, uh, work six, six days a week? I mean, that's impossible. You've got to work seven days a week or else you're going to go under. And uh, so they made fun of the Jews for that. But the pagans didn't have particular uh, worship days. What would happen is that the priests of Rome, they were called the pontiffs, um, uh, the priests of Rome would set certain days as holy days. Uh, we've declared a holy day to thank the gods for victory in battle. We've declared a holy day uh, to celebrate the advent of spring and pray for a good crop. We've declared a holy day to honor the emperor, holy day. And so every so often they would declare holy days and it would be a time of national celebration and everybody would get out and go to the temple and, um, and make their sacrifices and then head home and that'd be a great day. Um, and the Christians were asking the questions, can we participate in that? I mean, can we participate in what is a cultural, societal, governmental um, holy day 
and we'll shorten that to holiday, uh, should, we, should we participate in the holidays that, that the pagans decide are, are holidays, or should we say, no, no, only God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, he's the only one who can declare a holy day. Um, can we do that or not? And in, in addition to that, if, if you'd come out of a Jewish background, uh, you did have the Sabbath as the day of worship. That is the day you're supposed to worship. And, and the Jews suffered greatly because they adhered to the Sabbath day as one of the reasons why Jerusalem eventually fell when it was surrounded in 70 AD. Um, the, the Jews refused to fight on the Sabbath, and the Romans knew that, so they, they you know, did all their, their war-building stuff on, on, on the Sabbath. Uh, but the Jews suffered for that, and they were very much concerned about their identity as people who worshiped on the Sabbath. And then Christians began worshiping on Sunday. They began worshiping on the first day of the week to honor the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The question is, which day should you worship? And that's not exactly um, uh, sort of a uh, museum piece of an argument. It actually uh, has gone on and e even into our own day. Uh, when Debbie and I were up in um, uh, Connecticut, we went to Mystic Seaport, which is sort of a, a, a rebuilt uh, um, seaport town um, in Connecticut. And, uh, and so you, you walk through the exhibits, and they have some nice uh, ships that, that have been restored. They have the only surviving wooden whaling ship in the world, uh, Charles W. Morgan. And so you look at the ships, but they also have the ver various shops and chandleries and uh, things like that that are restored. They have the homes that are restored. This is like the early 1800s. It's, it's really a great place to go. You ought to try it sometime. Uh, but uh, the church in town, you go to the church, and we saw on the, on the front of the church, is walking in, it says, the Seventh-day Baptist Church. Seventh-day Baptist Church. It's sort of like they were splitting the difference between here and up the road a little bit. So, uh, but these were folks, and they were entirely Baptist in their doctrine, but they had been convinced that they should worship on Saturday, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And you can, you can hear the arguments for that. God told us to worship on the Sabbath. It's in the Ten Commandments. God didn't get rid of the Ten Commandments. It says that we rest because God rested after six days of creation. There's the seventh day, and God rested. We should be resting. We should be honoring God by keeping the Sabbath. And so up there at Mystic Seaport, Connecticut, uh, if you were Baptist, you'd go to the Baptist church on Saturday. Now, the problem with that was Saturday was also the best day for launching ships. And uh, so on Saturday in the morning while church was going on, the ships would be launched and the whistles and bells would be ringing and, and all the crowd cheering and everybody in church didn't want to be there. Sort of like Super Bowl Sunday night. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they, they just didn't want to be there. Uh, and so that created a problem. But uh, they're, they're well-meaning people who uh, take the data, take the scriptures, take um, the, the, uh, the centrality of Christ, all those things. Starting from that point, we should worship on the Sabbath. Others, we should worship on the first day of the week to honor Christ. Others that, well, we can participate in pagan holidays. Others, no, we can't participate in pagan holidays. And the question is, what can you do? We've started with the core convictions, the, the central truths of the Christian faith, and we've wound up in different places of application, and they're starting to collide with each other. How do we relate to one another? And Paul's basic answer is going to be, well, we welcome each other. Uh, says that in verse 1. But he also says that in chapter 15, verse 7. It says, you know, welcome one another the way Christ has welcomed you. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of the, the whole point. But we've got a full chapter plus a paragraph in chapter 15 to go through. So for a few weeks, we're going to be uh, looking at this issue uh, and, and uh, sort of surveying what what the Holy Spirit would say to us from that. So that's the issue that we're dealing with. Those are the particulars about dietary practices, about when do you worship, what day is better than another, and how do we respond to, to each other in that regard. So with that, let's uh, look at Romans chapter 14, and we uh, uh, begin reading at verse 1. It says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. 
One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Let's bow together in prayer. The gracious Heavenly Father, we confess that patience is not a cardinal virtue with us, that patience does not come naturally, and that patience is not something that we extend to others in our relationships. So we first of all thank and praise you for being patient with us. Father, you put up with a lot not just the quirks of our personality, not just the odd things that we do, but, Father, you put up with our rebellion and, and, and uh, our, our sin. Father, you put up with the way that we ignore your will for us and go our own way. Father, you are so patient with us. And we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts, to bring us back to you, back to where we ought to be. And we ask only that you would make us now patient with one another, patient and loving and merciful, and rely upon your Holy Spirit to work out the conviction and the changing of hearts and minds, our own and those of 